up for a high octane conversation. And I'm going to hand it over to Michael Horn to, uh, to introduce it. So this should be fun. Thank you, Deb. I see John starting to come up. Everyone come on up. Yeah. We're not going to have a conversation if it's just me. Your choice, Scott. <laughs> All right, yeah, take the mic then. All right, no, thanks so much. Uh, uh, Michelle, thanks for your uh, for, for highlighting that important work in that report. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, excited for this conversation. As Deb said, we are going to mix it up a little bit. We want it to be a free-ranging conversation, hopefully some good disagreements, and uh, we'll, we'll unearth some of the tensions in the future of higher education uh, and higher ed redux. Uh, Rick Levin, I'm not sure if Rick's here today, but he said I was going to go into the cost disease and stuff. I'm not going to do that, but I'll start with introducing Scott Pulsifer, whose university, Western Governors University, I would argue, uh, has has affected that uh, uh, cost disease and changed the equation. Uh, and then right next to him, my friend, uh, colleague, John Katzman of the Noodle Companies. We have uh, Suzanne Howard from IDEO U. Uh, and then the birthday boy, there you are, uh, hopefully not hung over from last night, and Andrew Grauer uh, from uh, Course Hero. So uh, the first conversation I, or, or question I'd love to dig into uh, is have you all reflect on looking back 10 years from now, what do you all think of all the innovations afoot right now? What do you think will be the most promising innovations that we'll reflect upon and say that was truly important? And then we'll get into the noise later. But let's start with what you think will be most promising. Any of you can jump in. And I'm going to call on you, John, to, to start us off. I think we're starting to see the seeds of agile universities. You know, when you, when you start an innovation, a lot of times you want to you silo it so it doesn't get stuck in all the noise and the, and the politics of the mothership. And then at some point, it's large enough to, to absorb back in. Um, universities are just starting to think about, how do I take my online programs and just make it part of my practice? There's one marketing, recruiting, instructional design kind of spine. And you know, students are experiencing universities in any modality, and we're indifferent uh, on a day-to-day -day basis or on a semester or course basis. I can jump in here. One of the things that I know I'm most excited about in the shifts coming in higher ed are the diversity and variety of places that new educational content's coming from. Last night, I think most of us were pretty inspired by Arne Duncan's speech, and one of the things that touched me was hearing him talk about the power that one great teacher can have in anyone's life. And I think for so many of us, designing high-quality online learning experiences we're trying to scale access to the world's most amazing teachers and then wrap an experience around them that makes them even better than they are in person. And so I'm really fascinated with all the different places that new content is coming from. For me, especially being inside of a corporation at IDOU, I'm also interested in things that IBM is producing and Google and seeing how people are experimenting, companies are experimenting with expressing the skills that they hope to see from the marketplace and then trying to attract and, and build those capabilities at large. I'll actually build on top of that. Um, that idea that great teachers won't be disrupted in the power that one great teacher can have is something that's very emotional for a lot of us and it means a lot. I actually think that because of the power of internet access that I do believe in aggregation theory and that with the ability to lower the cost of distribution, to be able to lower the cost of transaction costs, then actually you can start to modularize the access to the suppliers. And in this case, the, the access to the suppliers is on the teachers and the resources associated or produced, packaged and distributed by those teachers. So in that case, what can actually happen is that individual teachers could and should and will have a lot more impact. And what I think as a visual for that concept of if you do believe in aggregation theory and what will happen there, then maybe a simple analogy is to start to think about what do different aggregators look like in different verticals? Uh, if you thought about what does Netflix for studying look like? What does, if you, if you have in entertainment you have Hulus and Showtimes and Voodoos and all of these things. What does that look like in our space? Maybe you start to see it with a Coursera or a Masterclass, et cetera. But how do you start to amplify the best teachers 
and start to in increase the access to the best talent and also the investment in the into the production value associated with uh, distributing that content will go up, up and up and up, basically highly correlated with the revenue associated, maybe the subscriptions or subscriber numbers with those different platforms. I, I just want to take exception to that and uh, you told me to. I did. All right. 20% um, <laughs> of tuition is faculty. It's faculty teaching. Like people focus on trans transformation in higher ed by th saying how do we how do we make teaching less expensive or how do we make teaching uh, uh, different and all of the savings, if we want to focus on the 800 pound gorilla in higher ed, which is cost, the savings are anywhere else but that. So helping teachers like, uh, and professors uh, and, and scaffolding around them with all sorts of great content is really important. But the primacy of the teacher, I think, is going to remain because it's everything else that this room should be attacking. I, I, I would say among the many things that I think are being reinvented right now, the one thing I'm, I probably would put at the top of the list that reinvigorates the promise of higher education is first and foremost, we'll look back and realize that, that this time we're doing a much better job of aligning the learning outcomes to the competencies needed in the workplace. I think that the advancements uh, and the you know, rapid availability now of data and information about what really is needed in the workplace and how does that actually align back into the curriculum design uh, we're seeing significant advancements in that today to where it's closing the gap between what you're acquiring in higher, educa higher education as well as the alternative providers that is increasing the alignment of what you're coming out of. The learning experience is going to actually be more aligned with what you need to be successful in whatever opportunity you, you pursue. The second thing I would say is, uh, is dramatic is the, uh, the endeavor to redefine what the student's experience is in learning itself. The personalization of that learning journey is probably one of the areas that uh, that we at WGU are particularly uh, fascinated with because it starts with the simple premise that every person can learn and it's the job of the institution to adapt the technology that's used, the faculty engagement with them, all the tools and the support models, everything else, to increase the probability that every individual will advance in their learning to ultimately master and develop the proficiencies needed to be successful rather than an approach that says you have a fixed amount of time to do that. And so for us, it's more about a progress in direction than pace, and uh, I think even Arnie mentioned this uh, yesterday that that the time can be a variable rather than you know the learning and the outcomes themselves. And so the personalization of learning, I think, is a huge area where technology is dramatically changing the effic efficacy of faculty, of the learning models, of the content, everything else. That the personalized learning is going to be a phenomenal impact on the attainment. Andrew, do you want to get in there and before I ask my next question or uh, see you amped John, up? it's my birthday yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I can interpret your response from the perspective of an institution. Maybe my perspective is taking it from the demographics of the students and the educators in the country. And I think when you look at students today, we've got... 40% of all students in the United States and in the United States in post-secondary education, uh, so we're talking 8 million or so students, are actually working uh, 35 or more hours per week while they're actually going to school. So you've got basically a full-time job on top of uh, being a student. We've also got about a, over a quarter of all students in the United States in post-secondary post education are parents. And so you could be working, you could be a parent, 70% of students have debt, the median debt is about $37,000. So I think that when you're in such a hopeful situation, but on the other side of things, you're incredibly stressed and anxious about what you're doing, then I think there's a huge opportunity to give more access to affordable and better resources. And I think there's now this opportunity to do that because the cost structure is not associated with a certain number of students, call it one to 10 to 100,000 students enrolled in one institution, but actually leverage one of the most powerful assets, which is the teachers and the resources to reach across institutions. So you basically upped the number of potential customers per uh, supplied good 
I think that's extremely powerful. And what is really interesting to me is also the commonalities that are happening between the demographics of students and the demographics of educators. So historically, we had about 50% of educators were tenured or tenured track. And today, it's something more like 30%. And so, say out of maybe one and a half million faculty in post-secondary education in the U.S., uh, you've got our teachers uh, teaching in multiple institutions and teaching multiple classes there and on the side working at Starbucks to just be able to afford what they're doing. And there are some amazing teachers here who are not being able to make the impact or be, being given the resources to be able to do what they do. So I think that, that's, that's the perspective or where I'm coming from when I, when I think about it. Um, when I look at the cost structure of the institution, you'd know that way better than I. Can, can I just weigh in on something? Uh, I don't think we should generalize about the cost structure of an institution because I think what you referenced would be true if you have more of a brick and mortar classroom based model of learning. Uh, at WGU, we have a very, very different cost model. Our faculty could probably comprise about 60 to 65 percent of our costs. Uh, if you add in the learning resources on top of that, our costs of effectively teaching is about 75 percent of our cost structure. We absolutely do not have the costs that most institutions have to deal with in terms of de the delivery of the learning that really is required by students. We do n recognize that that is very disruptive to an in industry that has a cost model where 20 percent is faculty versus ours where it's probably 60 to 65 percent. That's fair, but ever since you next, the kind of ed tech community has assumed that degrees are gonna be less valuable, that faculty is gonna be less important, that the narrative arc of a university, what we are trying to teach you is more than a collection of courses, that all that stuff is vestigial. And everybody who's made that bet is lost. Like, it's a bad bet, and I don't think it's good from a business point of view, I don't think it's good from a social point of view. I don't think it will make education better to pursue that road, even, even if it did turn out to be a business. So, so, so this might go into my next question, and, and maybe, Suzanne, you can kick us off here, which is what's most worrisome to you that's going on right now in the name of innovation, and, and, what, is this, and, and what does this look like? Uh, so s same thing, 10 years from now, we look back, what's most worrisome that we should be uh, uh, focusing on? Yeah, I think, so my perspective is coming to this from not inside of the system, but coming from looking at workplaces, what workplaces need, and how we can train up more people on the skills that are needed from that angle. So the equivalent inside of a higher ed institution is a little bit more at the level of the master's degree or the exec ed programs. Um, we got into this as IDOU because there was an incredible demand for IDEO to teach the innovation approach that we have all over the world. And we tried to support it for three decades by guest lecturing in courses by running our own boot camps, and we were frankly not pleased with the scale of education that we were able to provide on design thinking approaches and innovation approaches through things like boot camps. It wasn't sustained, it wasn't changing behavior. So we decided that we needed to design something that would fit with the modern work experience, and so we're coming at this puzzle from a slightly different angle, which is much more about how is work evolving and what is the room for educational lumps and, and on-ramps. I love what Michelle was just sharing. I think the kinds of things that we're sharing are things that fit with the modern work experience. So in modern work, we've talked so much about the gig economy, tours of duty, people spending two years in a place. Even inside of regular work, you see people working on projects, which means they have a little bit of white space in between. And so I think one of the things that worries me in the ways that I'm not seeing higher ed evolve is thinking about um, the size and shape of an educational experience. So I think there absolutely are innovators, most likely in this room already, but how can you think about work experiences that fit into those interstitial moments and those transitional times? A lot of online educators are designing things that are three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. They give you space to get just deep enough. It's not just a YouTube video and a little micro, tiny micro learning. But these things fit in and really move the needle on behaviors out in the workplace. And I see them as, I think there's some great innovations happening from higher ed institutions thinking about internships to get people into the work marketplace. I wonder about the opposite direction. So what's the example of a educational internship where somebody from the workforce gets to come into higher ed for a two week period and get deep into something and then go back out and continue to practice that in their workspace? That's one of the things that I wish for. 
I would, uh, one of the things that I find most worrisome, quite frankly, is the lack of accountability uh, in terms of the investments that are going into education. And, and when you think about student attainment rates, if you think about uh, uh, return on the investment that we put into education, the, uh, the measures of outcomes in terms of does it actually lead to the betterment of the individual's lives, uh, we seem to, uh, you know, we seem to generally have this perception that institutions are just responsible for delivering the education. It's up to the students to what they do with it. Uh, I, I understand the uh, agency that exists with every individual, but I think we should be cr uh, hold ourselves more accountable to the promise of education, that in fact the investment in it actually uh, creates the surest path to opportunity and provident life. And I think that we, uh, both from an institutional standpoint and a student standpoint, we can have better measures around how to advance things like progress and pace and persistence and attainment but also how does it drive outcomes in terms of are you getting the opportunities? Is that translating into economic well-being? Is that translating into engagement and overall well-being? And that we have to recognize that. Now, that being said, is that uh, there are many new entrants and new models of doing that. There, are, there, are, there is a lead time to actually being able to measure that. So we should be comfortable with that there are going to be new innovations, alternative providers, alternative credentials, you name it. There's going to be, lead, going to, going to be a lead time to, uh, to measuring those uh, outcomes. Having said that, that doesn't mean that they're absolved from those outcomes. That we have to recognize that only innovation with outcomes uh, is actually worthwhile. Otherwise, it's just a, a bad investment. And and I, I would say the other thing that worries me, quite frankly, is those bad investments. I think we have an increasing amount of dollars going to things that don't directly impact access. They don't impact learning. They don't impact uh, student attainment, success, etc. And and uh, it feels a little bit like money is still going to building malls, and I would not be investing in building malls going forward. I think we need to think more about what's really driving innovation and learning and access and outcomes. So the things you can measure in the short term in education, higher ed or K-12, don't matter. Um, the things you can measure in the long term, true longitudinal outcomes over the next decade how do these students perform in the job force? Uh, how do they perform as people? Are they happy and healthy? Um, how are they part of the community? Um, those things really matter. The next generation of, of accreditation, in a sense, has to be looking in, in, in a big data kind of way at the students coming in and what were the outcomes for various programs that really do matter over time. The mix of things I can measure, I mean, the problem with long-term outcomes is, of course, you're measuring something that happened a decade ago, um, sort of like a Hubble telescope, and, and, um, and you're not getting real-time information. The mix of short-term and long-term metrics and constantly correlating the two as people game the short-term metrics is really hard. Um, so it's easy to say, you know, we do accountability terribly. It is hard to say, how would we do it well measuring things that actually matter, um, and who's going to take up that, that fight? It's just, it actually is possible. Uh, I mean, the long term doesn't actually happen without short term progress and measures. Uh, it is possible. So I, I would say that at WGU, we are quite obsessed about student-centered metrics around uh, success measures. And some of those are very simple, like literally in term, how are you doing and progressing on pace to the, pace, to the milestones you need to be achieving in term? We actually even take those progress measures down to a course level. Now, you have to actually have persistence from first term to second term. If you don't have that persistence, you're not on your path to attainment. So there are those short-term measures that you, can, uh, that you can actually track and measure and, in, and constantly improve so that you know that as students are coming in, you're increasing the probability of attainment. Longer term, you absolutely can also track the now having attained that. How is that translated into employment gains, into income gains, into overall engagement and well-being, all those types of measures, including overall, what is your general satisfaction five or 10 years later, such that you can measure even like what's your recommend rate among your graduates and alumni? It's like how many students or uh, graduates are actually saying it was worth the cost? And I think the studies from Gallup show that those students who say that my investment in my education was worth the cost, they're seven times more likely to refer others to their institution to education generally. So the short-term measures and the long-term measures matter because you can't get the long-term without the short-term. So you do have to obsess about both. My notion, to your point on accreditation, is 
you can actually track both. We should actually uh, think about the long-term outcomes, not just the mechanisms or the process measures, too. Accreditation tends to focus on how you do it, not necessarily whether what you do is high quality, does it drive outcomes, et cetera. I think we can do both. I wanted to build a little bit on that. I, I guess throwing everything out as the short term doesn't matter is a little too bold for me. Um, just to share a few of the things that we're doing, and I think many other online learning institutions are doing the same. So first of all, inside of all of our courses, we always have human instructors who are tracking and looking for the best in case impact story. So this is just a qualitative start. We capture those impact stories of people truly making progress in their work and then we go deep with them and study them so that we can constantly understand what helped them be successful, what helped them apply what they're learning into their workplace and into their own projects and then continually tweaking the courses to make them better. Then when it comes to data, because it's online, we can track all sorts of engagement data, completion data, we have satisfaction data, net promoter scores. We're constantly benchmarking marking against other educational experiences so it's not just the joy of learning, but taking into account a little bit of that friction that needs to happen for them to learn. We measure their self-assessment of are they applying it to their work and are they having impact. We come back six months later and measure that again. And then when we have pilots inside of companies, that company is not gonna come back to us and keep buying the online learning experience if it's not having the impacts that they need. So they're always running their own tests, which we get their data and pull it back in to figure out what's better. So I feel like these are, these are absolutely shorter term, but they're important metrics that so many of us are tracking to improve the quality of these different kinds of learning experiences so that we can hopefully share them with others and then build a larger learning ecosystem that serves a wider range of needs. I think an unhappy metric is the dropout rate in the United States. Uh, I know we referenced yesterday on the screen 83% attainment in high school, but actually in college it's 40% of people drop out. That's 40%. 40% of people who take on debt, they take on the opportunity cost of what they else what they could do with their time and replace in in place of that. They put their reputation on the line, their fam family on the line. And I think the thing that's most worrisome to me is the amount of stress and anxiety that that students are feeling today in, in the United States. I, something became pretty clear to me uh, only after I met uh, one of our students, uh, Lisa Misrahe, and she actually chose to go back to school when she was about 53 to get her, her bachelor's degree. And she's actually got six kids, and two of them are adopted. And she, she works, she wakes up in the morning, she drops her kids off at school, she goes to work, she goes back to school, she eventually gets to go to sleep, and she didn't even take on debt because she thought she was too old to be able to repay it and have it make any sense. So she was figuring out any which way to be able to get financial aid. And I thought this was an incredibly heartwarming, hopeful story that is so difficult. But then we realized that this sort of non-traditional student is the norm. And that's, that's incredibly wild. And I, that's just not okay. It's a systemic issue that we have. And I think figuring out how to segment that problem, it's not the case in all institutions, of course, but figuring out how to se segment that problem and actually make progress against that in higher ed, I think is something that is achievable and doable, but is incredibly worrisome. What you're talking about, though, what you're all talking about, is that the metrics for a given program against a given demographic might be totally different. And and most of, the way, most of the metrics you gave are appropriate for exactly what you're doing, inappropriate for a community college serving uh, uh, new immigrants. Uh, so yeah, those are, those are good. And, and again, the short-term metrics may matter if they're predictive of long-term outcomes. And, and it's an assertion that they all do um, that, that that probably doesn't have a ton of data behind it yet. I think I'm not saying this model is the right one for other circumstances. I think what I'm trying to advocate for is a more human-centered approach to the higher ed ecosystem. So when we are designing things, I absolutely agree with you, Andrew, that the what we call the non-traditional student is really kind of the epicenter of what the educational experience needs to be designing for. And so when we can bring an approach that studies them, studies their needs, 
helps us shift the size and shape and the economics of the educational experiences to flex and flow with the ways that they need to work and learn. I think that's an approach, and then we can sh pick the right metrics for some of those situations. So I, I, I want to jump into uh, what's missing right now that we should be seeing and we're not seeing. And, and uh, you can jump off Michelle's report. I thought that was super interesting in terms of the scaling or, or the lack of scale of these uh, opportunity on-ramp programs that we're starting to see. Obviously, there's a demographic, Scott, that she was referencing that you serve. Uh, so I'm just curious, but you don't have to anchor on that. I'm just curious, what should we be seeing that's missing right now from the higher ed uh, innovation landscape? Well, I... I do think that uh, some of the some of the data around the population of adults that need to be served by more of a continual or learning model or a lifelong learning model is evidence of what Andrew is sharing. Is that uh, we should probably recognize that the notion of a non-traditional student is just false. It's an outdated model of your traditional student being 18 to 24 years old. You know, it's already 40% of the population today that are over 24. It is surely gonna be within the decade, we'll see it, that the majority of students in higher ed are gonna be over the age of 24. Um, and so the, the one thing I do think about is that what we are missing is we are not thinking fully about how do you truly develop a credential roadmap for a lifelong learning model. We still have most of the investments going into tradi traditional degree programs. Uh, so the on-ramps that Michelle talked about is like you see a lot of innovation, but none of them scaling effectively enough. Uh, partly, I think that's because the employers yet are, have figured out how to adapt to the uh, acquiring of the talent. They're coming out with the non-degree credentials. Um, and so, for example, even how WGU has solved for this is that in our own degree programs today, we integrate industry-recognized certificates into the programs, but we don't deliver the certificates yet standalone. What, but what we do know is if you come out with a degree that also has seven industry recognized certificates, it dramatically increases your marketability and the value that you can actually provide for the institutions that hire you. Having said that, we still design primarily around a degree model. Um, and so we, have to do, we do have to figure out how do micro-credentials uh, do two things. One, how, how do we scale the availability of them and the cost and affordability and access of them? Second. How do we also have reinvention, reinnovation going on in the hiring on the employer side of that that says, in fact, I will take sub-degree uh, workers directly into these programs. It's going to pay not just a livable wage, but in fact, a provident wage. Uh, that's a difference, me and my opin opinion, a livable wage is month to month, no savings. But a provident uh, wage is I can also save on top of the living. Um, and so the, the employment community, as much as there are microcosms of this, it's not happening at scale yet. Um, so I think that's one area where I would say that this has to, the acceleration there is still not yet happening in micro-credentialing. I can share here. I, I, um, I think that's very interesting. One of the areas that I'm curious about, there's been so much conversation here about the softer skills and the fact that we need, that's something everyone needs, the soft digital skills, the collaboration, the creative problem solving, empathy, grit. Um, I would love to see more of us teaching those explicitly rather than just making them a side benefit of some of the educational experiences that we provide. Um, I, we're working on trying to teach a course about collaboration and that's not something that there's yet a ton of great courses out there on and so, I wonder, as we're thinking about competency-based education, I'm curious even to ask Scott or, or others here who have experience, are we starting to see competencies be developed for learning experiences around these kinds of softer skills? I know that's something that the workplace is really craving, is the ability to assess how well a new hire is going to play with everybody else on the team. They wanna know, are they the type of leader that I actually wanna hire? And so they're developing their own assessments at a leadership level and wondering if there are things brewing in higher ed around this angle. Can I just offer one perspective really quickly? We should stop calling them soft skills. We, should, I, we prefer power skills and enduring skills. Um, soft skills that tends to imply soft, cushy, you know, comfortable, et cetera, versus the most enduring skills are critical reasoning, communication, both written and verbal, analytical horsepower, problem solving, et cetera. Those are part of the core liberal education now, uh, so we should start thinking about empowering enduring skills. And I think even the evidence in the workplace shows that 
while STEM may get you a high paying job right at the door, within 10 years, those actually you know, possess those power skills, the earnings of those actually catch up and they actually continue progressing at a rate faster than those that just stick to a skill. This is my general correlation back to my worry about skills-based transcript. Although we're advancing this, we have to be careful that that, doesn't, uh, that, it, that somehow excludes these power skills because the competencies around those that we mentioned, those are critical for actually the lifelong uh, part of that. And so a competency-based transcript does not mean, or a skills-based transcript doesn't mean that, it, it, uh, that somehow it excludes these power skills or these enduring skills. I love uh, that from term. a curriculum standpoint, by the way, just really quickly, it's like we already have these today in our competency-based model. Uh, we are also taking a very different approach, which is uh, we think it's a little silly to somehow pack the first part of your uh, credential program with all the gen eds versus applied general education and rethinking basically how does it actually weave into your overall cr program curriculum rather than packing the front end with all the dream killing things like college algebra. You know, like how about you figure out how to apply math and apply analytical skills into the course of your program rather than packing everything up front is like, first you have to prove to us that you can do all this before you start developing the program specific skills. And so we're thinking uh, and are designing much more around applied applied gen end model. So you wonder why things don't scale, and it's because we can't even agree on what to call uh, 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 any of these uh, skills. If you think about degrees, the reason they're so enduring is that we know what they mean. Like a master's, an MBA means something. There are different flavors, an MIT MBA means something different from a, from a Booth MBA, but they're but they're of a type, and they're knowable, and employers know them. When every university creates its own micro-credentials, its own power, soft, whatever skills, its own uh, uh, certificates, it's a mess. It's unscalable, it's unusable by employers and employees. The notion of, and, and you know, Credential Engine and, and, and Strata, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Lumina, have tried to sort of create a Rosetta Stone to help people understand it, but it's not a, it's not a scalable solution. What I'm trying to do at Noodle with, with my uh, schools, and we're just in the foothills of this, but what we need to do broadly is if we really think that these uh, smaller certificates are valuable, let's come up with a naming schema, let's agree on what the spec is, let's agree on certifying authorities that say this is this is a new set of things that you might want to have as an employer, you might want to get as an employee, but at least there's an object that's knowable because right now, this is the definition of unscalable. I think the reason I see that we're not yet aligning is because everybody's trying to define their own system. I'm not saying that that's the way to get there, but if there are ways that we can get true collaboration across institutions to start to define a common language, I think historically and in this moment, yes, people know what degrees mean and they know the value of a certain degree from a certain institution, but I believe that world is starting to fray around the edges and so people are looking for a new meaning system in what to call these kinds of skills and mindsets in the workplace. And so I think that's exactly what it would be amazing if the players in this room would come together to co-articulate. I'll go ahead and say I love power schools. I think we should brand it that way. Uh, if we just look at the context of working in a company, I think it's really interesting to look at three different things. One, we first and foremost need to set goals. We need to set some sort of objective. And whether that's a vision and a mission and a strategy, you need to be able to vision where are we going to go. And then we need to set up effectively accountability to be able to get there. And the last thing we were calling it, and it, it doesn't matter even if you do brilliantly the visioning exercise and the strategy and you set the accountability structure, if you don't have great interpersonal relationships, you don't have that trust and that understanding and credibility between each other, these power skills, everything else does not matter. And I think understanding that from the context of the employer, 90% of students are actually looking to go to college to be able to get to the next step in their career, to be able to get security in their life, to be able to get jump-started, to be able to buy a house, to be able to support a family. 
And so I think that's a great context if we're setting people up to be able to effectively work in the workplace, then I think that's something really important to integrate. Can I just weigh in? I, I, th I think John and I probably gr agree uh, quite a bit on this point of badges and micro-credentials and everything else because I do worry that, uh, that, that the proliferation of these is in fact going to uh, create a havoc um, because you're right. I think that if every institution or including all the alternative providers decide to actually market and brand their own badge, micro-credential, certificate, whatever you want to call it, uh, these things will proliferate to where, in fact, the market, the consumer of those credentials, the employers, the workplace, et cetera, they don't know which ones actually have value. I think uh, if Matt's still here from Burning Glass, there is clearly evidence that while these badges were starting to show up on resumes and applicants, uh, you know, profiles, everything else, it didn't mean the employers were putting them in their job descriptions, that they're seeking candidates with them, et cetera, that it could very much be like the fund industry, that there are more mutual funds and ETFs and their underlying stocks. And you're like, that gets really confusing for the consumer. Um, so there is some, there, there does need to be some anchoring around what are those market certificates and credentials that exist that then multiple providers of that can standardize around that and said we are a provider of that certificate. And, it's like, and th some of those exist today in more structured environments, definitely around technology, cybersecurity exists, medical and healthcare industry definitely has some industry recognized certificates and there are multiple providers of those. But if every institution like WGU or Harvard or MIT and, and uh, the flagship publics and community colleges all of a sudden start saying, oh yeah, we're giving you a certificate in leadership, you're like, I don't know what that is, you know, and, and what it include. And so then you start having to look at a course transcript and something else. I think how you can get to solving that is you end up with actually a skills base. There is a universal skills based transcript or a competency based transcript that gives some kind of taxonomy to the consumer of those credentials to say, it's actually the competencies I care about, not necessarily all the certificates on that. Last thing I would say is that um, I don't believe that the de degree is going away. I, I view degrees more like ranks, uh, um, that uh, you're always acquiring competencies that ultimately stack to ranks. And there may be sub-degree ranks, then there's degree ranks, there's post-degree ranks, et cetera. I think that clearly signals to the market, if anything, that you possess the capacity for learning. And that's a very, that's a power skill. And that's something that everyone seeks. So I want to jump off that because now we've had competencies referenced many times. Uh, and you, <laughs> Suzanne, you said you wanted to ask Scott a bunch of questions about it, but I want to go to John because uh, Secretary Duncan yesterday said you know he would flip the system from a learning, uh, learning variable time constant to a time variable learning constant, uh, which we think of as competency-based education. I've heard you speak skeptically uh, about competency-based education. Love to hear your take on it, but you also have the largest provider of competency-based education, I think, in the world here. So uh, love to have that uh, 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 back and forth. First of all, all higher ed is competency-based. Every course you took had a grade, which was ostensibly that you learned something. So, so what competency-based really means is not that we're going to measure that you learned something, that we're going to know what it is we're trying to teach you and see if you did uh, get that. But it, there's a promise in competency-based that actually we can do that much faster, that some students can do it much faster, some students slower, and that, and that we should not assume that, that uh, 14 weeks is the right amount of time to learn some, some basket of skills. Again, there's not a lot of data around long-term how much how much do you save, like what, what percent of students do it way, way faster than 14 weeks? What percent take way less than 14 weeks for that basket? The cost of, of detaching from the schedule, the, the cost of making it uh, uh, variable is the social aspect of learning, right? The, what you really learn a lot of times is how to collaborate in a class, and, and like the workforce where you're collaborating all the time, um, students going through a learning experience together and collaborating on various things has value. If every student's working on their own schedule, that's harder. It's not impossible, but the combination of good social learning and good adaptive learning is really hard. So, so the question of what we're giving up in the social aspect versus what we're getting by moving around the time schedule a little bit on a per-student basis, 
I, I, I am skeptical. I haven't seen a lot of data that says that that trade-off has proven out yet uh, just about anywhere. Um, well, I might say that I think you're confused about the promise of competency-based education. I, I don't think that CB's promise was that students could accelerate, that it would take less time. I don't think that's actually the promise of competency-based education. I think there were uh, th maybe a, a, a multi, uh, um, there were multiple portions of a promise, but I think one was simply that you could better align learning outcomes with uh, what are what competencies are required in the in the marketplace and by employers, et cetera. That you could clearly had you are you are forced to design the curriculum itself to say these learning outcomes and these learning objectives for which every student has to be proficient. In being proficient in those competencies, then you are going to be uh, marketable and valued in the in the opportunity in the workplace. The second thing I think is part of the promise is that it increases the personalization of learning. That in fact, you are not now fixed in a time period. Because then, if you fix people into a time period, the only way to measure or assess individuals is to give them a grade. But even a grade has issues with it, because even getting a B, you don't know if an individual is one, a deep in one section of the course, or whether they are shallow in all sections of the course. So it's no, you don't really, really know is like getting a B, like how proficient were you, versus you have to be proficient or you are not. Uh, and so the last thing I would say is that uh, it does, av it makes or increases the accessibility in a way that says, how do I leverage all the learning that I've acquired or amassed in other environments and apply it to the advancement in the pursuit of a credential? Uh, we recognize that uh, there's a one very notable one that came up because the graduate posted on Reddit, Someone who'd been working in software development for a very large, well-known company in Seattle, then worked at the other very large, well-known company in Seattle for like 20 years, and finally completed the person's bachelor's degree in three months in software development. And everyone goes, this can't be a real university. That can't be a real program. Why? Because the person spent 20 years learning how to do everything that you need to do to accelerate so quickly through, in fact, what our own academics and curriculum faculty designed into a program that has the equivalent of 120 credits, and that person's already spent 20 years mastering all those things. But we've never given the person a credential for it. So why not let the time vary and let the personalization happen, and this person says, I am, in fact, proficient. I personally think that we've all experienced competency-based education, even in traditional educational environments, because what did we all do? We spent time on the areas that we weren't very clear and uh, we didn't have mastery, and we didn't spend a lot of time on the things we didn't uh, need to spend a lot of time on because we are proficient. So I don't think the promise was you go faster. I think the promise was is that the learning outcomes are gonna map to the opportunity, that it can increase the personalization of it, and that you can also leverage learning that occurs outside of the classroom. I just wanna jump in before I ask my final question, or you wanna respond, or? I just have one question for respond. the room. On a scale of one to 10, 10 is total mastery. You know this subject as well as anybody out there. And one is, you have no idea. Just without saying it out loud, just what number is competent in your mind? Do I get an answer? Um, oh, well, yes. I just, just now, a quick show of hands. How many people said five or less? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, that's the problem, right? Is competent is in the eye of the beholder, and the majority here sort of think competent is, you know, you know it pretty well. Like, you're a little better than mediocre. Think, it, of it, think of it. Think of it this way. Mastery-based education, I get. Competency-based is fuzzy to me. Well, think of it this way, though. If in fact the competency or proficiency in every course you have to take is B or better, what would be the graduation rate of typical institutions if you had to graduate with a B or better in every single course that you took? That's what competency is designed for at D WGU. That says you have to demonstrate mastery at least at a B or better. And there are more. You know, I get more emails from students about this issue than anything else. I've taken this assessment three different times. I've not yet you know, mastered this. Like, can you please make an exception? No. If we do, then you undermine the point of competency-based education. It's like you have to keep working until you demonstrate proficiency at the level of proficiency uh, that is determined for that environment. And what I do know 
is that 100% of our employers are saying like our students, our graduates are well prepared for the work that we have and they're, they're having, that they, we have them doing. And so I do think there's a level that says, hey, if the proficiency level is established at this, then if everyone has to maintain that, you'd have a very different outcome in a traditional model that's great and term-based. So I deem you all competent and hopefully mastery of great panel discussions. And given the time, I'll wrap it there and uh, join me in thanking the panel.